In what way is 2020 like 1929? Neither of those economic disruptions is a market failure. Both crises have a common cause, interventionism. The actual mechanisms that triggered the two contractions, however, could not be more different. How is 2020 unlike 1929? The output contraction of 1929 to 33 is a direct result of the sharp reduction in the money supply. In 2020, politicians issue orders for the sharp reduction in the supply of goods and services. The first one is a scene of omission by the Board of Governors of the Fed. The second one is a scene of commission by many state governors. The collapse of investment and production 90 years ago was a direct result of the collapse of lending. Most of these bank failures, however, would not have happened if the Federal Reserve had done its job. This system was created as a lender of last resort in 1913 for a time such as this. The Fed had only one responsibility, if and when bank panics begin, to provide cash to all solvent but temporarily illiquid institutions in its system. The Fed governors failed to recognize the magnitude of the problem and stayed idle. In a financial game of dominoes, a third of the banks shut down, never to reopen. The Fed's monetary mismanagement destroyed most small businesses. The resulting 25% unemployment created public demand for interventionism and elected FDR. The destructive New Deal policies prevented a quick recovery and scarred a whole generation of Americans. This paved the way for the counter-cyclical Keynesian policies that undermined our economy in the 1960s, the fruits of which we had to reap in the 1970s stagflation. What we have today is not a recession. We don't even have a name for such massive state-mandated liquidations of the middle class. For a lack of a better English expression, I suggest we call it an economic harakiri. Every time I turn on the news, it feels like Sanders or Maduro have won the presidential election and suspended the constitution. Toilet paper is gone, so we must have built socialism. And we can't even blame Trump. The president has gone above and beyond to assist all local needs while upholding his oath of office that includes no interference in the way states manage their specific health problems. And he is adamant that we need to reopen each state's economy as soon as the governors stop panicking and realize that the shutdowns cost more human suffering in the long run than they prevent in the short run. Some are quick to point out that in 2020, as in 1929, the US economy faces big challenges with pre-existing conditions. It's absolutely true that easy money caused massive misallocations of capital in both the 1920s and in the 21st century. To complicate matters, we enter 2020 with massive public and private indebtedness. The debt-to-GDP ratio at the federal level is approaching the one we had at the end of World War II. That scary figure is dwarfed by public debts, and both combined are just the tip of the iceberg compared to the unfunded liabilities, much of them at the state level. All of this was sponsored by the Fed, and the use of tariffs as negotiation tactics in the past couple of years does not help either. I have been crusading against expansionary monetary and fiscal policies since the second Bush administration. These are important perennial questions. Alas, addressing them today will do absolutely nothing to prevent the collapse of the national and global economy if we keep most of the American businesses closed. Let me use a parable to make my point crystal clear. Imagine that you are a doctor in the ER. The paramedics bring to you on a stretcher an HIV positive guy who has just sustained multiple gunshot wounds. Which problem do you address today? 
the chronic illness that, left untreated, may kill the patient in 10 years, or the excessive bleeding that may stop his heart in 10 minutes. In the movie Outbreak, the commanding general orders the Air Force to annihilate an American town to stop the spread of a deadly African virus. The war tactics of governors like Cuomo against the Chinese virus seem humane. In practice, they are pushing our country toward an outcome that will take many more lives than the final solution developed by the military in that movie. We don't have the ruinous deflation of the 1930s. We are not haunted by the stubborn inflation of the 1970s. And we are not facing a financial meltdown as we did in 2008. As in the previous three episodes, our troubles are man-made. Thankfully, this one is the easiest to solve. Reopening all businesses today, instead of incentivizing workers to seek unemployment benefits and entrepreneurs to borrow from the government, will erase all losses by Christmas. And at a lower death toll than the current restrictions, it's time to let America go back to work.